Can you hear me drink this Coke? No. <laughs> I could just, it can hear you like swallow sometimes, but not like. Ooh, chugging. that's worse. Yeah, it is. Ooh, ooh. Chug, chug, chug. I have like most of the can. I'm good. I won't fall asleep this podcast. <laughs> well, that's good. Yep, that was good. I was, it was touch and go for a while there before I, I opened it. up the, the, the pop. <laughs> Just enough caffeine. Mm-hmm. Coke, sponsor us. Delicious and, and refreshing. Ooh. More so I would want ranch water to sponsor us. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. Hey, Wanders. Welcome back to another Foolish Wanders podcast. The podcast about anything and everything. We've hit 101 episodes now. Woo. It's a feat. It's a feat. It's a I'm feat. proud of us. Not Over many people years. can say that. Yeah. All right, and before we start this episode, we want to thank one of our college classmates, Russell, for the inspiration for this podcast. And we want to thank him and his daughter, Nora, for being amazing supporters of this podcast and for listening and tuning in, like, every week. So thank you, guys. Now we shall get into the history of the playground. (laughs) You just keep, like, looking at me like I'm crazy and I don't know how to respond. (laughs) Does it sound, like, awkward or something? I think playground and I was like, playground the, i that couldn't tell what you here. said no i couldn't tell understand what um, you said i was like what playground yeah of playgrounds mm-hmm. there you go okay now i hear it okay so up until the late 19th century children didn't really have official playgrounds it wasn't until around 1885 in germany when the starts of playgrounds called sand gardens S A N D gardens started to pop up. <laughs> what are you laughing? At? Just a name? Yeah, like for one, I don't know, like stere- like stereotype for Germany. Germany's not like fun. Like they're it's very st- they're like stern. serious pe- yeah, stern. Yeah. So I just I don't know, I think it's cute that the playground started there but it was yeah. a sand garden a sand, a sand, a sand garden. garden yeah it's kind of cute and it actually germany plays a huge role throughout like a lot of childhood things like kindergarten this is a german name yes, kinder is child mm-hmm. and then what is garden just like garden garden <laughs> it's like basically so we'll get into the creator of kindergarten too grow. okay yeah basically it's like growing children that's growing what, your knowledge yeah pretty much child, that's like yeah. kindergarten is okay or yeah with yep. sand garden, Did, sand isn't like garden. a sand? What's that sandbox? Is yeah, it just a sandbox? It's a, it's a giant okay. sandbox. <laughs> did you have a sandbox growing up? I did. I think, if I remember correctly, I think we had one of those turtles, like the big plastic turtles. Everybody had that freaking turtle. Like in the nineties, that was like the biggest thing. Uh-huh. Like the sandbox turtles. Oh yeah, yep. I think there's a crab one too. They're Ooh, cute. The turtle one is fun. Yeah, little tykes was my childhood. Mm-hmm. We had like the little car and like yeah, we had a lot of little tyke stuff. But yeah, so basically sand gardens were giant piles of sand or sandboxes for children to play in. And the first playground to be established in the U.S. was in 1886 in Boston. It took until the start of the 20th century before playgrounds really started to attract attention. Really? It's surprisingly late. Yeah. We'll get into some of the different, um, so why it happened when it did and then how the styles of playgrounds changed. Okay. Because it's kind of interesting, the evolution of the playground. All right. So as industrialization and urbanization grew, so did the concern for public welfare. Humanitarian experts saw playgrounds as a solution to cramped quarters, poor air quality, and social isolation. So this this new concept could keep children off the dangerous streets and help them to develop their physical health, good habits, socialization skills, and overall just enjoy their childhood. Yeah, like if you look up like pre-war, um, apartment buildings like yeah. in, for example new york city they are scary they are yeah well it's just like overcrowded and 
close. teeny like teeny little rooms like long teeny rooms mm -hmm. and then usually they will like overlook like a courtyard in the center and mm -hmm. that is your um window yeah it's just it's on the sad. one side <laughs> yeah oh <sighs> I'm very thankful to live like in this time period and also to have like a house and have yeah. a yard to run in. <laughs> yep, me too. Well, yeah. Apartment, but you still have like I a have nice a open yard for Inca. Yeah, and... and I have a deck. Yeah. I'm not looking out into like a cramped courtyard where people probably are like throwing garbage I mean, and stuff. Yeah, like garbage garbage and liquids and liquids. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, very true. Yeah. All right, so now we're going to back up just a little bit. So as the popularity of sand gardens grew in larger cities, people started calling them playgrounds. The introduction of sand gardens in Boston in 1886 has been credited as the beginning of the playground movement in America. Even though the German play movement had gained strength in America in the early 1920s, when a crude outdoor gymnasium with gymnastic equipment was built in Salem, Massachusetts in 1821. Oh, wait, you said 1920s. Oh, sorry. In the 1820s. Thank you. I don't know why, but my brain just goes 19. I don't know why. Probably because that's like we're closer to from it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. So it was built at the Salem Latin School. So eventually interest in using the outdoor gymnasium dwindled. When the sand gardens experiment began in 1886, people were intrigued and their popularity rapidly grew, thus establishing the beginning of the playground movement. The earliest known use of sand brought into a public area for children's play was in the public parks of Berlin, Germany, in 1850. So Frederick Frobril, he is the founder of kindergarten. He's the one that basically was like, kids, because before that, kids basically started school like at first grade, you know, like when they're like seven, eight years old. Mm -hmm. And before that, people were like, they're not old enough to comprehend things or to have like social skills. So he was like, well, yeah, they need to be taught those things. So basically he made a kindergarten. Oh. Cool. or child garden so that way they could start getting some of those skills and he promoted the importance of free play as well as nature play for his children so his model kindergarten plans emphasized the need for opportunities for kids to contact with natural materials and then to be designed to, designed into his concept of a garden of for play so the kindergarten movement spurred into these sandboxes in german schools and homes so his kind of thing like free play free play is basically you have like an open area with like some maybe some tools or like some just like rocks or whatever and just let kids have fun like go play in the wilderness or like whatever that's i think kids need that they do even <laughs> more today today, today. Yes. go yeah, touch we'll, grass <laughs> go just touch a blade of grass mm -hmm. throw a stick in the air it's fun a stick's the oldest the oldest toy a stick yep. why isn't a rock well, a stick is more friendly. It's like it's a sword. It's a magic wand, and the rock is a a ball. A <laughs> it can be a ball. It can be a pet. It can bludgeon things. It can open, you know, it can a hammer. Things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stick can poke. I mean, what are you yeah, playing? You play. Okay, if you're playing with a stick, it's either a sword or like a spear. Okay, or a magic wand. But what are you using the wand to do? Wave at people. But, like, your spell is probably, like... Um, Have you seen that, that TikTok? <laughs> <laughs> There's a TikTok trend that was going around for a while. It's basically, you just pick up anything that looks like a wand and just go... <laughs> There's, like, a... What? What? I'm so gonna that, find the sound. What's the spell? I'm gonna find the sound. Hold on. TikTok. I don't think they were saying that in Harry Potter. Just, like... Did you see that guy that made a Harry Potter wand that worked? No, I haven't. It like shot fire, like fake fire, but sort of real fire. <gasps> oh, and it cool. shot, he, sh he shot it at his girlfriend. Oh, well, that's sad. <laughs> it looked intense. I would have been Ooh. so pissed. Oh, yeah. It looked like a real like ball of fire that just like flew out of his wand. Was and she then... expecting it or was it just No, like... she wasn't oh. expecting it. She was sitting on the couch. She was well, looking that's... down. Oh, yeah, not good. <laughs> yeah, not good at all. Here's the sound. Hold on. <laughs> That's the spell. Yeah. Okay. Yep. TikTok. Woo. Okay. <laughs> I remember when I was in, I think I was in middle school, we went to see the high school's like Wizard of Oz play. 
and um the wicked witch of the west she had um or is it that or whatever the is it east that west. tries to capture dorothy west i think it's the west well, they both they don't well yeah because east south dies west. east yeah. dies okay. from the house, the house. dorothy's yeah. house falls on her and kills her okay so it's the west yeah, yeah. Yeah, she um, was, like, sinking into this platform, like, through a trap door, and she has, like, a, a magic wand that shot sparks out of it. Cool. So that was pretty cool, but nothing like a ball of fire. <laughs> so, okay, back to playgrounds. So the introduction of sand gardens to America was prompted by Dr. Marie Zwarzyka, who, while visiting Berlin in 1885, observed children playing in heaps of sand in public parks under the supervision of the police. So she wrote a letter to Kate Kate Gannick Wells and the chairman of the executive committee of the Massachusetts Emergency and Hygiene Association, or MEHA, which resulted in a large heap of sand being placed near the Parmer Partimer Street Chapel and the West End Nursery in Boston. It's basically just a giant pile of sand. Since, <laughs> since the piles of sand are in such a hit with the kiddos, more piles of sand were placed the following year in the yards of the Children's Mission per, uh, Parmenter Street Chapel and the Warrington Street Chapel. Within two years, there were 10 sand gardens and 21 sand gardens by 1899. So they're just big piles of sand? Just piles of sand. I mean, that's all that kids really need. Yes, honestly, yep. yeah. I remember when my parents, like, we were, like, building our house. There's this giant pile of dirt. And my mm -hmm. siblings and I would just run up and down it and, like, get covered in mud and dirt. Yeah, it was so fun. I should go do that. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. It was fun. So the early sand gardens were built in poor neighborhoods and near settlement houses that were home to many immigrant families that were arriving in America. The efforts of the char charitable organizations to rescue children from the dangers of the slums resulted in the beginning of the child saving movement, which worked to improve the conditions of children by establishing, establishing playgrounds and recreation areas, as well as other programs to alter the effects of the poverty that they experienced. So the need for playgrounds in the large city slums were, was a recurring thought, since it was felt that the small towns and the countryside offered ample opportunity for nature play, and the wealthy families in the cities had large yards for, the, for their children to enjoy. So it's basically like, get out of the house, <laughs> you need some place to go besides your tiny apartments. Because like, you do, as, as a human, you do need more space, you need to be outside and touch a blade of grass. Or something. Yep. Throw a stick. Throw a stick in the air. So pretty much a child saving notion. Mo 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 blah blah blah, sorry. This child it's saving notion. <laughs> Auto correct. So pretty much the child saving mo movement was brought about and influenced by the middle class women that liked to spread their motherly influence and wanted to emphasize <laughs> the de dependence of the social order on proper socialization of children. Hasn't changed. No, it has not. Some stuff stay the same. Yeah. So this is the definition of the child saving movement from sage journals. So the child saving was a conservative and romantic movement. So it means like romantic, like romanticized mm -hmm. movement uh, designed to impose sanctions on unbecoming youth and to disqualify youth from enjoying adult privileges. The child savers were pro prohibitionists in a general sense who believed in close supervision of adolescence, recreation and leisure. So... Supervised club, so club Karen. <laughs> yes, basically, yeah. Yep. Don't run too fast. Put down the rocks. Mm -hmm. Only use your sticks for magic wands and swords. No stabbing. Probably not even swords. Probably like oh, use no. your magic wand and pretend it's a broomstick <laughs> that you sweep up <laughs> your house with. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's probably yeah. <clears throat> that one grain of dust. You just sweep pretend it. Pretend that it is a butter churn handle and you are churning butter. Do you think these ladies know how to churn butter at this time? No. Well, I bet they romantic. She said romanticize. I bet they must yeah. romanticize like provincial, like could be. Yeah, farm life or something. I have no idea. I don't know what these Karens think. Yeah, I'm glad Club you Karen. Club Karen. So the child savers received both positive and negative feedback for their activism. On the one hand, they were heavily criticized for being too radical, while on the other, they were praised for their revolutionary efforts. None nonetheless, the child savers brought about a new realization of hum humanism throughout this time period. So they tried to get them a better life, but they also tried a little bit too hard in some senses. Yep. So now we're jumping back to sand. So the use of sand gardens spread very quickly, 
to include schoolyards when the Massachusetts Emergency and Hygiene Association was given permission to use vacant schoolyards in the summer for sand piles. Eventually, the MEHA turned the responsibility for the operations of the playgrounds, or sand piles, over to the school boards and park commissions. In 1888, G. Stanley Hall wrote The Story of a Sand Pile, where he described the high play value of sand. This short story details the neighborhood boys enjoying a sand pile for the entire summer that her mother had brought in for her two sons. As a psychologist, Hall studied the children's behavior and the great attention that they gave their play. He felt that the sand play had great educational value that promoted social and symbolic play. So good for your brain. Mm -hmm. Because of the development benefits of sand play, sandboxes and sand tables are used in early education settings. However, the use of sandboxes in public parks, parks and other school playgrounds requires regular maintenance to keep them clean and free of debris, which has led to fewer and fewer in public parks and having them avail available. Yeah, there are like band-aids and other yeah. nasty things that get stuck in there that you have to fish out. Yeah. yeah, it's gross. And then I've heard some reports of like the stray cats and stuff because it's a giant litter <gasps> box, you know? <laughs> oh, no. So, yeah, so it's just like if you have it for your like own use, like if we had a sandbox, you know, we had like a water table that we played with as kids. Oh, yeah, like, those are cool. Things, those are fun. way cooler. <laughs> They're do both you remember, fun. Like those, do you, like, do you remember at like museum, like some museums had them? It'd be like a water table, but it was like how water would move. So you would um, have there'd be like dams and mm -hmm. like stuff. You would cl you know use like close the water up with a dam, yeah. <laughs> and then like let it go, and it would fly oh, down there. And then there might be um, like you know like levees and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Those things are cool. Those are cool. Yeah, a good learning tool. I want one now as an adult. Just outside on your porch, and just have Inca. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'd be more for me. Definitely more for me than, that, than like than like kids. Okay, I can see you having one for like your kids. I can't too, but to be for me. <laughs> You're just like push your kids out of the way. It's for mom. Get out of the way. Mm -hmm. And like those like little like I had a Barbie Jeep, but okay. I wanted like a like a like a car car or something. Okay. So yeah. I'm getting, I'm going to totally get my kids like a little Cadillac, like a Cadillac Escalade. <laughs> yes. yes. I think we had like a, um, a John Deere tractor one that just it was Ooh. a tiny little guy. See, it that's fun, fun too. But that if you're fun. not a girly girl, you don't want a hot pink Barbie Jeep. Yeah, I feel you. Yeah. And since I lived in like the woods, you know, by a lake woods um the yeah. barbie jeep didn't work well enough so my papa my grandpa he put chains on the <laughs> tires so he made little custom chains for the wheels of my barbie jeep that's awesome oh my gosh did you yeah. just go everywhere with that thing yeah i love that thing that's awesome do you still have it or did you get rid of it no i sold we sold it because i'm getting the i'm getting my kids a shit like a yes like a, yeah, like a tall army of women or Escalade. <laughs> Just get the, what is it called? The G Wagon version. Oh my gosh, yes. That's super boozy, <laughs> bougie ones. Mm -hmm. Heck yeah. All right, so now I, have, I just have like a um, photo of a sand garden. It's just a giant sandbox. It's like a circular. Um, ring made out of like cinder blocks it looks like filled mm -hmm. with sand and there's a bunch of kids being supervised by a couple of adults most of them look like girls they're just like they sitting do. there like plopped in a heap in a dress like they just yeah, kind of, they don't yeah. look like they're playing they just kind of look like they're it looks existing like they're just, like, shuffling. yeah in the universe yeah they look like they're just like shoveling it into a pile by their feet just kind of <laughs> just building little mounds of sand. like how long do I have to do this Three hours! Oh, jeez. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they look like. <laughs> it does. There's just like this one grown man in the center of it, too, or off to the side, just chilling. This little fedora. But he has his hand on his hips. He is not happy. Do you see that? He's oh, got the one, one... sitting in there, though. Next, it's like. There's, a, there's next an adult to the little in boy. it? Yeah, it's like. Oh. It's a, uh, adult. Maybe it's just a little boy that Maybe has a hat. Maybe it's a little boy with a hat. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. But yeah, do you see the adult after the, that's standing there? The dad, he's just like, yeah. oh, he's like, I'm supposed to be doing all this other fun stuff. It's like, I'm just watching children make piles of sand. This is a great day. Mm -hmm. All right. 
So in 1906, the Playground Association of America formed to promote ideas of playgrounds to communities, including their benefits, construction, layout, and design, in the conduct of activities to occur on these playgrounds. So some books and articles have stated that an ideal proper playground would have separate play sections and athletic fields for boys and girls. So they would be supervised and would feature shelters and toilet slash bathing facilities, shaded areas, garden plots, and swimming or wading pools. Which is wow. actually really nice. It's a lot more than we have nowadays in most areas. <laughs> mm-hmm. if, like now it's just like we, we have like a um, sand volleyball court or like a bunch of playground equipment, but there's not usually pools associated with it. Or like we finally got in the town I grew up in, they finally got a splash pad. What's um, that? So splash pad is um, basically it's like a um, I don't know if it's like a rubber like a I think it's kind of like a rubber um, mat basically it's something to like absorb the water um, or let it drain through but then it has like a whole bunch you know like when you go to water parks and there's like that bucket thing that dumps water on you or like mm-hmm. the mushroom that like sprays water it's basically like that stuff but just like on a flat surface that little kids can run along and not have like a body of water to risk like falling in and like drowning <laughs> it's just like just go splash in little puddles and get water dumped on you it's just like a fun thing for like little kids especially all so, right yeah. cute yeah it's fun so in the early 1900s playgrounds were not the free-for-all play however however you want like today they were people trained to be instructors that taught children necessary lessons and organized their play wow so very strict. you cannot <laughs> you cannot you're, run you're playing wrong you're playing very wrong. You cannot run. You cannot use magic wands. Yeah. So play, in quotations, would include equipment lessons, parades, theater productions, and other activities. So it's like parades. very... Parades? I don't know what that means. I don't know if that's like they organize little play, like parades around the playground. <laughs> I don't know. That's super weird. Okay. It's very structured. Uh, variations, however, could be found throughout cities and in rural areas, determined by the community's allotted space and finances. Soon, manufacturing companies found new businesses in playground equipment. Early equipment were built with galvanized steel pipes, strikingly vertical and horizontal elements like ladders and chains, all of which are considered dangerous by today's standards, according to the Consum- Consumer Product Safety-, Safety Commission. And by every human being... Yes, a, like if you as a parent, like if you look at some of these early playground equipment things, they're like twenty feet in the air, <laughs> climbing up ladders, running across steel pipes. It's dangerous. It just is like the <laughs> definition of a bad idea. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Why? What in the yeah, heck? It's, just, it's like just standardized steel pipe planks, and they're just like here. We'll put them together in a frame, like thing and put some swings on there and attach some ladders so they can climb up 20 feet in the air and some no chains nets. yeah just, just some ha- just some chains <laughs> yeah nothing some chains hanging wrong. yeah nothing yeah. bad will happen they'll be they'll fine the little learn. timmy will be okay they'll be fine if he breaks an arm it's fine yeah i mean my little timmy falls 20 feet and yeah. breaks both of his legs <laughs> oh poor timmy how does this okay how does this even look fun though like it doesn't look fun to me like even as a kid it's just like what I mean- I want well I mean like back then they didn't really have playgrounds like we have today so like they basically it's just something to climb up and climbing for kids is fun I would just want the sand pile <laughs> this just looks like oh, not fun yeah. yeah it just looks like a bunch of random pipes stuck together and some ladders yeah. and some chains just climb up run down yeah. slide down the poles yeah fall down the pole I don't know <laughs> just fall down mm mm-hmm. mhm So the Great Depression and World War II halted the rapid development of the early playground movement. During the Depression in 18... Sorry, in 1933... The Depression was caused because of this lame playground equipment. (laughs) Terrifying equipment, yes. So President Franklin D. Roosevelt created the Works Progress Administration, or WPA, one of the several federal assistance programs to put the unemployed back to work. So among many of the work projects, 3 million WPA workers built highways, schools, hospitals, airports, playgrounds, and more. Then came World War II, and more pressing priorities of wartime production resulted in murals being painted over, metal equipment sold for scrap to build the war material and weapons, and Mm -hmm. works by prominent artists were lost or stolen. So the playground supervisors became a thing of the past. Parks and playgrounds suffered from a lack of maintenance and went into disrepair. Many playgrounds were sadly torn down due to to their lack of upkeep. 
There are still a few WPA creations that continue to function today and are being renovated as historical sites. But yeah, you can actually, there's actually a website. I have to link it. Um, there's a whole list of all these parks that still exist today. And you can go visit them and play on them and stuff. And I have a picture, Kendra, you can look at the next slide. Uh, one that's in New York, too. So, uh, mm. so it looks normal. <laughs> yeah, it does. Like, it looks like a pretty normal, yeah. but it's also been renovated. So I don't know if it's the original stuff they put in. Okay. Or if it's, like, revamped. It looks like a normal playground. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, like, it's very metal. Uh, metal and wood, which, mm -hmm. for the time period, that makes sense. Okay. Okay, so by the 1940s, the economy was surging back to life with industrial production of war equipment and further accelerated with the onset of World War II, and the WPA was suspended. During the war years, 19, or the U.S.'s involvement with World War I, which is 1941 through 1945, metal was diverted to the war effort and production of steel playground equipment virtually halted. Children in many schools were allowed to take periods off from school to gather scrap metal for from nearby farms or businesses and place them in piles at the edge of schoolyards for military trucks to pick up. That's weird. <laughs> it is. Yeah. But everything at this point was like, help the war effort. Go find I scrap know, metal. But <laughs> if I was alive yeah. during that time, you can bet the hour I would take off would be math. <laughs> as yeah, soon as they were like, open up your home from last night, I'd be like, Oh, um, I gotta go help the boys in blue. I gotta go... Wait, the boys in blue is police, aren't they? I think so, yeah. Okay, whatever. Whatever the military people are. The troops. Yes, the troops. <laughs> I, gotta go, I gotta go support the troops. I gotta go That's find here. scraps of tin. Bye. That's a, yeah. So to the, at this point, to the children that were just uh, picking up these scrap pieces, this was their playtime. This was their fun for the day. Eh, not th it's fine. Yeah. It's just not as like fun, I guess, as playing on a playground that you yeah, could. I mean, you could break be like, your arm, but you know, you could be like, do you see that rusty can or like rusty barrel over there in the distance? I bet you, I can beat you to it if you run to it. Fair, yeah. And then okay. someone falls the and like cuts themselves on a rusty tin can, and they have to go get a tetanus shot. Yeah, that's this so is fun. still fun. Oh yes, tetanus shots, fun. Mm -hmm. Even before the war events were occurring, a simple but revolutionary playground fantasy called the Junk Playground was brewing in Denmark. I don't like it already. <laughs> we'll Does it come it. with a free tetanus shot? I wish. No. Every yeah, entry you get a that's... tetanus shot? <laughs> I wish, but that's not included. That's the extra VIP package. Okay. So Darn pay an extra $100, $100 and you get a free tetanus shot. Typical Denmark. <laughs> So, the concept of a junk play playground was proposed by Carl Theodor Sorensen, a Danish landscape architect. His proposal was tested during the German occupation in 1943 when he created a junk playground in Emdrump, a housing estate on the outskirts of Copenhagen. So, long before World War II, indeed, over centuries, children played in construction sites, garbage dumps, junkyards, and wild places. They found, they found and borrowed their own tools, built their dens, forts, and played their own creative games. So even my dad, like, when he lived on a farm when he was growing up, he and his siblings built, like, little huts and, like, tents and, like, forts in the woods. Like, yeah. we just built stuff it's all fun. the time. Yeah, it's Tree fun. houses and stuff like that. Yeah, you just build stuff. Mm -hmm. So they did all this without supervision of adults. So Sorensen's dream included uh, trained play leaders... So John Bertelsen was the first play leader at Endrup. Enabled by architect and former seaman Dan Fink, the central idea of Sorensen's junk playgrounds was to make play in playgrounds the imagination of the child, not the imagination of the architect or builder. So children themselves with assistance from play leaders, later called play workers in the UK, would create playgrounds for themselves and choose their own play objects and forms of play. So basically, like you give them some tools and some sticks, you know, make your stuff. That was the whole premise of it. Hmm. Which is fun for like a designer child. Like, I think that'd be fun. So as Endrum's reputation spread, the visitors began to encourage the concept in Europe, Asia, and the United States. Lady Allen introduced junk playgrounds to the UK in 1945 and coined the term adventure playground. Established several adventure playgrounds for handicapped children, and she also influenced many accessible playgrounds for all children. So she, she was pretty into the stuff and did a lot of really cool she stuff. She was into parks. Okay. Into <laughs> playgrounds. Making fun places for kids to go. 
So in 1950, Macau's magazine sponsored the first adventure playground in the United States in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Oh, this endured for only 12 months. Oh, it was fall. <laughs> Take <laughs> my o o back. Yeah. This endured for only 12 months, but was followed by several quote vest pocket parks. So vest pocket parks are basically small parks that were frequently less than three acres, inserted into intracital spaces to provide an open space experience of respite from the city or refuge from the city. Uh, design elements include hard surfaces, movable furniture, water features, often to drown out the noise of the city, and potted displays of annual plantings. Some are privately owned and managed by foundations, which open them to the public for designated hours. So you can actually see a lot of those still. Like they still. In Minneapolis? Fun. I think in like pretty much any city. They're just like little side parks where you can go hang out. And it's just like a, it doesn't have to have like play equipment. It just is like oh. a place you can sit down or like yeah. just do it for a while. So over time, the adventure play concept was explored in several states. The lifespan for most American adventure playgrounds is short due to concerns about the junky appearance, expansion of safety regulations, fear of injury and liability, shortage of funding, and lack of support from the community leaders. So despite their strong reputation among developers, child users, and involved parents, most disappeared, but a few model examples still remain. In 2012, three adventure playgrounds remained in California, basically just California. So there's in Berkeley, hunting... Huntington Beach, and Yorbalina. So the Berkeley Adventure Playground opened up in 1979. Here, children seven and older play in adventure play tradition, focusing on wind, earth, fire, and water with a wide, wide range of creative materials for building forts, towers, and boats. Children younger than seven only play in close proximity to, to play leaders or other adults, and safety rules are supported. So Berkeley leaders attend to safety, accepting only scrap materials and activities meeting their rules, which makes me feel a lot better than just people bringing whatever they want. Yeah, because <laughs> like, people are icky. Some, especially nowadays, yeah. Yep. Uh, so adventure playgrounds are not rule-less. At the Huntington Beach Adventure Park, kids are able to build stuff, go exploring, um, and yet get thoroughly filthy, all without messing up your own home. Uh, it's modeled after the no-holds-barred, free-form adventure playgrounds of Europe. The Urberlina playground opened up in 1983 on a 2.2 acre plot. Campers, as they call the kids, register in advance for theme sessions. Kids bring hammers, nails, saws, which is surprising, and paint to build forts and play games. A zip line deposits them in a mud pit and they test their skills on obstacle, obstacle courses. So, like, the Yorbalina one is mm. out of the three that you have photos. That yes. one looks like the like the most planned out and thought out yeah, and does. sort of clean. Mm -hmm. And then the Berkeley one looks like Burning Man for children. It, exactly. Yeah. It looks the, crazy. <laughs> when I first looked at pictures of, like, the Berkeley one, I was shocked because it's so covered in graffiti and it just it's just scrap wood everywhere. Which, in theory, like, that's what these adventure parks are supposed to be but it's just like in this dirt like looks, field yeah it looks like lord of the flies it looks like lord it of the does. flies it does like scrap wood just yeah. put together hodgepodge yeah and then the huntington beach one that one looks kind of fun that one um, looks fun yeah it's just like a giant mud puddle there's rafts that kids can push each other on like across this little mud puddle and there's ropes courses and there's like little forts kids have built and trees and stuff it's fun. And then the Yorbalino one has like a little splash pad, I think. Um, and there's like some actual like lawn. What's it called? Oh, what's it called when you like plan out your yard? Landscaping. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Like mm -hmm. actual landscaping going on. Yeah. So it looks, I think this one is in um, Orange County though. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But Berkeley too is. Okay. Yes. And that Huntington one's... Beach is. Yeah. I just I did it for the listeners. I made the money. Money. Got some monies. Money signs with my hands. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to move on to novelty playgrounds. So the novelty era, era of playgrounds emerged in an effort to complement or compensate for typical playgrounds with paved surfaces, fences, and traditional equipment. So in order to replace or compensate for sand, slides, swings, and jungle gyms, designers created novelty, imaginative or fantasy sculptures like rockets, vehicles, and historical pieces, utilizing massive molded concrete climbing forms with tunnel mazes and a labyrinth of shapes and spaces intended to exercise the imagination of children. 
These novelty parks were essentially fixed and resistant to change or movement by children and described by some as more appealing to adults than children. Yeah. I like <laughs> I like these the best so far. <laughs> these are cool. Like, Come on, novelty cool. playgrounds, that's cool. They are cool. I've seen a few too. Like in one like of the in towns, real life? Yeah, I've been to there's one so there's one in the town that I work in. It's like she had like a ship. And it's like two cool. levels. And there's like a little like ropes course within it. You can like climb up the ship and like it's really cute. It's by the I lake like and that. it's cute. I like that. Um and there's one that in the town that my grandparents live, um, we used to call it Castle Park. It's not called that, but it looks like a castle. It's just like this wooden structure that has like towers you can climb up and down. There's slides, there's like a little wooden dragon. It's really cute. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's one of my favorite places, and it was, especially when we were little kids, like, oh, we'd go there all the time, it was so much fun. So during this era, a number of cities developed imaginative playgrounds or modified existing playgrounds, 60 parks and squares in Philadelphia alone. So they went hard on the novelty. The Los Angeles Park Department built a wide array of equipment-themed villages, novel slides, and multiple-purpose ex- exercise equipment. And some of these included, like, a shark and octop- octopus rockers. So, like, those things you sit on, you, like, go back and forth on springs. Yep. Yeah. Yep, they're fun. Um, manufacturers predicted that steel action-oriented equipment would remain a priority. Plastic would replace steel in some applications. Plate sculptures would become more popular. Molded swings and shapes of animals would be developed. And equipment would be designed for specific age groups. And equipment would be lower in height and installed in gravel and bark pits for greater safety. So that's just kind of like some of the predictions they had at this time of like how they would... The mulch. Go. The mulch. The mulch. They're spot on with that one. Yeah, they are. <laughs> that's that like, then... if I smell that, I, I think of like a playground. Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh. Also, the um, now they have like rubber that they, like old tires. I don't they like that because it smells yeah. like a nasty tire. Like, it does. It's, it's, it's not as refreshing as mulch. No, but you don't the- get splinters. <laughs> True, but like I would take the splinters and the nice smell rather than smelling like a dirty old tire. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Although in my um, so when I was growing up in my elementary school, they had gravel instead of like mulch or anything. <laughs> so that was interesting. We did I'm, too, like little rocks, little tiny pebbles, little pebbles, <laughs> and you would get them like stuck in your like knees constantly, yes. or like, like your palms of your palm. hands. Oh. My yeah, like you'd fall and like if you or like you slid on them hard enough, you get like scraped up super mm-hmm. easily. Yeah. yeah. Did you best. have the pla- did you have the plastic slides or the metal slides? We had plastic. Okay. Yeah, you had metal ones. I had metal and then they got rid okay. of those and they got the plastic ones, but the problem with the plastic ones is that those um they are in parts, they're not all one. Mm-hmm. So those ridges where the brakes are, the material like the brake. Oh, yep. Hurt like a mother. Oh my goodness. And sometimes they'll even have like the bolts yep. like the like on the inside. Those hurt too. Yeah, those are not fun. Like I remember some kids, especially like towards the bottom, like the break on the bottom, kids would like stand up and jump over it. It's like you come down and you <laughs> just jump over the break. Yeah, it was fun. I always like those um it was like a I don't know what it's called, but it's like a bouncy bridge. So it'd be sort of like like a bridge, you know, and like a bridge, like segmented. but it would be like segmented or there was one that had sort of like a, it was like a rubber mat that was Yay. the, I like that one. Those are fun. You yeah. just run along and it's like yep. super Bounce. jiggly. It was yep. fun. Yeah. All right. So the standardized playground era reflected the design and redesign of manufactured playground equipment, primarily the four S's, slides, seesaws, superstructures, and swings and the surrounding hard surfaces typically seen on American playgrounds throughout much of the 20th century. So during the 1970s and 80s, standardizing playground equipment developed simultaneously with concerns about playground injuries, increasing lawsuits and information of task forces to prepare national standards for playground equipment safety. So the subject of the playground injuries is commonly seen in historical documents. It's so like the old ones are like 20 feet tall. It is reported that at North End Park in Boston, Quote, so with a modest supply of apparatuses without sand or under it, succeeded in two weeks and breaking a total of seven arms belonging to, to six boys. Yeah. So one of those boys broke both arms. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, <laughs> poor mother. Sad. Oh, my gosh. His poor mother. Yes. Feeding him like a baby, <laughs> brushing his teeth. Oh, no. Yeah. 
<laughs> and besides other casualties not reported. So there's like a lot of things that like broken bones or like other things that were not reported. I just imagine that little boy's like broken <sighs> arms. If it's like, oh wait, when did this happen? It was, it was like, it was before, it was like, I think so it was like before the 70s and 80s from my okay. understanding. So they had like probably like the weird cast. So his arms was probably just like this. <laughs> Just like, like outside. <laughs> no, no, his hands were up like a goalpost, yeah. like doing like the goalpost in football, like the "it's good" sign from the ref. Oh, like, yeah, that would be the hilarious. And then the kids during like recess would just be kicking footballs in between. <laughs> but wouldn't you lose all feelings? All all the blood would be rushed out of your fingertips. Yeah, like you. Yeah, you would. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but it'd be funny. Fun. It would be funny. It'd be funny. So it was suggested that some of the blame for these injuries rested with the city boy that not seeming to know what he could do and what he couldn't and needing yeah. more, quote, looking after than boys brought up in the country. So basically, like, didn't get told no and just shoved people off, play equipment, and then, like, broke arms. It's like, that's what I'm getting. Yeah. All right, so the modern era, building slowly during the late 1990s, entered about the turn of the century into a full-blown play and playgrounds movement of unprecedented speed. Even before 1990, play and playground research and experience were demonstrating that the nature and scope of playgrounds must be extended beyond the typical standard equipment. During this time, developers started incorporating elements of nature, like plants, streams, hills, different things like that, um, support structures like shelters, restrooms, cooking facilities, and different pathways, and portable materials like bricks, tools, blocks, and other things that kids can play with. American playgrounds are expanding to accommodate broader purposes and more diversified play materials and spaces. The lead to frequent designation as playscapes. The term playground is to take in an even broader meaning to include people of all ages. So intergenerational playgrounds, natural and built integrated playgrounds, and provisions for people of all abilities, accessible playgrounds. Even electrical powered or cyber playgrounds, which is basically social media. That's like I the don't one like that, that. I don't either. Get so rid of it. Modern one. Touch grass. <laughs> Go outside. And touch grass. I'm when you're put a little a, kid, you don't need social media. I'm gonna put a QR code on one of the, like those slides, and then when you scan it, it just has a picture of me pointing aggressively touch to grass. the camera. It's like touch grass. Touch grass. <laughs> Touch grass. But I feel like if a kid is outside at a playground, they're going to be touching grass. You're going to need to focus on the ones that are on their phones the whole time. Yeah, just yeah. airdrop it. Mm -hmm. Touch grass. So by the 21st century, a movement among professional organizations was building to create and expand playgrounds and enhance play for building fitness, health, brains, and bodies. The 1990s were named the Decade of the Brain, with 3,000 American brain researchers and $1 billion in research funds making unprecedented progress in understanding the role of experience, including play, in human brain development. Cool. So, yeah, so a lot of research is going into you know figuring out like kids really should be outside <laughs> and learning how to socialize with other kids and i think that's one of the things like with covid because you didn't really go to playgrounds oh and, no like, you kids, couldn't like a lot of that age where you're supposed to learn like how to socially interact with people that yep. was taken away for a couple of years so a lot of kids nowadays are suffering severely <laughs> with they're, that they're gonna be serial killers it, yeah I'm, I'm afraid mm -hmm. of that yeah. and like little kids um they learn um like emotions mm -hmm. and stuff like that through like seeing the whole face yep especially babies and then yes. like there's all those how many who knows how many like little babies that had to look at masks <laughs> like just your eyes masks, they could only yeah. tell they like, try to read things through people's eyes for a while yeah it's yeah it's sad it's really sad mm-hmm yeah, so I wouldn't be surprised if, like, a lot of kids nowadays that were, like, toddlers in this era would have to have extra either, like, s like, like, classes to help, like, put them back on track or just, like, held them back in kindergarten for another year or something. Yeah. That's, yeah. That might be the case of just holding them back. Yeah. So, yes, that was the... We ended on a depressing note. Well, if anybody has, like, children of that age, <laughs> they're like... <laughs> Oh no. Touch some grass, go outside, meet people mm -hmm. safely, but yeah. Don't use the neighborhood uh, sandbox because a cat might have used it, you know. <laughs> I love my cat, but I'd. I'd would use, be, she would use. She would use a sandbox if she saw one. Same, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. Inco might too, honestly. 
Which the ink is a dog. Yeah. That wouldn't surprise me if like a few dogs have gone in there too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think all those sandboxes actually in the town I grew up in, I think they took them all out of the um, playgrounds. Because they Sad, used to have them. but then... like there are, there are a lot of upkeep and you would want yeah. them to be clean and whatnot. And if they weren't doing that, then just get rid of them. Yeah. Have the cute yeah. little, little tykes turtle <laughs> sandbox in your backyard. Yeah. And that's yeah. good enough for me. Yes. Kendra's just going to be outside in her like a giant adult sized turtle <laughs> sandbox on her lawn chair. She's just up in a margarita. Yeah. Like, yeah. Feed in the like sand. The yep. In- oh, yes. Glorious. And you have like mm-hmm. a little pool, kitty pool next to you. Just to, like, I'm going to have a feet. VR headset on. <laughs> I'm in Hawaii. Yep, I'm in Hawaii. <laughs> that sounds awesome. All right, so some resources that I used include uh, PG or yeah, I said PG P E. <laughs> Sorry, no, you're good. Uh, SavingPlaces.org, Patch.com, Journals.SagePub.com, Wikipedia, of course, uh, StudioMLA.com, Scholaropedia.com, and AAA State of Play. That was a really cool episode. Yeah, I'm glad you liked it. And thank you, I Russell. I learned a for- lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I didn't expect it to be like this in depth, but there's a lot of cool like steps throughout history that stuff took and like they got better at figuring out what kids need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So thank you, Russell, for giving us a suggestion. Yeah. And I hope you did, did you justice with this episode. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. 50. <laughs> Inca says we're done. <laughs> She's quiet. It's at the very end. I'm proud of you, Inca. Oh, Lord. <laughs> All right, Wanderers, thank you so much for listening to another Foolish Wanderers podcast. We hope you enjoyed. And if you have any suggestions for future episodes, please feel free to email us at fwplisteners at gmail.com. Honestly, sounds like Inca has a few suggestions. Oh, Inca, what do you say? I don't know. I don't don't want to see her. She's not not even in the room. That's how loud she is. She's she's not even in this room. Anyways, so new episodes of the FWP are released from wherever you get your podcasts from, including this place that you're listening to right now. And if you'd like to help us out, obviously the best way is to listen, which you just did. So thank you. And But if you want to do a little bit more, we'd really appreciate it if you would consider leaving us a five-star review. Peace. All right, Wanderers, thank you so much for listening. We'll see you guys next time.